I mean, unbelievable stuff. So when you want to talk about a tight band, I mean, they they unbelievable until they're bored. You know what I'm saying? And and, and Black Thought is like a cyborg, man. I mean, him and Eminem are like machines. And the fact that you know they're also in the documentary is just great. I mean, I don't even I don't even understand how some cats are even wired, man. I mean, they're like out of the African Creole, you know, just the tradition of I could spit a bar and this bar can, I mean, just be endless and just be like so much wit. And there's so much, uh, it's so many um, hip hop artists. And I'm talking about those with 10, 15, 20 year careers, people like, you know, terminology, consequence. I mean, Sky Zoo. Sky Zoo got like 27 albums. And when I see that these guys don't get, or, or women, like women like Sapa the Great out of South Africa, you know, oh, there we go, right? Amy True out of the UK, they don't get, you know, talked about like they sh should. And this is why I built Rap Station. Uh, really built Rap Station in 2001, and it was like an MP3 depository, and then, you know, MySpace came along to be that. And then, um, then we turned it into, uh, radio stations, so people could go to the app, artist TV, really go to rapstation.com forward slash app, and you'll see that we are the ESPN of hip hop and rap music because we cover and play everybody. But it's audio. Right, right. Today, people listen with their eyes, so they kind of want to see <laughs> instead of listening to, and it's the era that we're in. But um, we cover it from the, from the aspect of artists do songs, we support it, we hold them up. Because number one, when you go in the studio, yeah. the number one thing is like, I came out with my baby now, who's gonna take care of my baby? Mm. And usually with hip hop and rap songs, it's like you did a cut, and then like, where are you gonna put it? You can't take it to radio. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, now I can put my stuff up on YouTube, but YouTube is a, is a universe where you could get lost in space. Mm -hmm. So we just try to corral. Now we're going to a point, you know, with <coughs> probably the most significant uh, app ever for hip hop and rap music, and I can just say it right now. It's called Bring the Noise, and it was bring, what is Bring the Noise? It's basically, it's TikTok for hip hop 35 plus. But it's dope. It's going to be dope. It's not uninviting. It's not uninviting because the other day, you know, just yesterday, you know, went to the um, at the party of the Grammy. And I ran, I walked past Lil Uzi Vert, yeah. and he had all kinds of things sticking up out of his head. <laughs> and I said, bro, you look amazing. <laughs> I held on to him, he said, good to hear from you, OG, I'm just a regular, uh, uh, right? like, That was just like, that's, that's what hip hop does, man. I was like, and he was pumped up after I said that, because he didn't think I knew who he was. And I was like, and I was like, well, I've been playing your music since since you was birthing in this thing, and I was packed up in the red carpet room when everybody was red carpeting, mm -hmm. and I was right behind, smashed up against you know the, the butcher from of Griselda, right, right. and I've been playing his stuff for a long time. So I mean, you know, we we curate, man, and that's that's the thing I always that's wanted to do: curate art. You know, yeah, no, definitely not. Well, speaking of curated art, when we talk about like hip hop, we know the different elements of hip hop. We know with the, the MC, the DJ, the B boy, B girl. Then there's also the graffiti element where we can you know talk about the art. Yeah. That kind of ties into this book that, that that you created, the Living Loud. What did you start with this background and and you know being able to to create these portraits and, and these you know paintings? Well, how, how did you even get started in that? 1960. <laughs> I was born and raised to be an artist all my life. I'm one of these dudes where, you know, you see like musicians who say, oh, by the way, I do art too. No, I'm an artist, by the way, I do music too, you know? I mean, all throughout my life, I come from an arts family. My great grandfather was one of, well, number one, he was one of the, and not that it poured down to me, I don't know. I, mean, I didn't know him. He died in 1923, but. He's the first black licensed architect in New Jersey. And the second black licensed architect in New York, and he worked on the Flatiron Building. Wow. 
which is still there, you wanted to look cruel. Of course, if you looked at him, you said, like, damn, is he black? He got green eyes, what's up? But you know, yeah, and then and, and he made his, you know, made his mark. But I always heard that in the family, you couldn't pull anything up, you didn't have computers. So I grew up always a person who was drawing in my grandfather. His son always drew, but you know, it was like, and then, uh, Marvel, com the comic book era came in the 60s and stuff like that, but I always drew. As a matter of fact, I didn't write my first poem until I was 20 years old. Wow. Let me tell you all this. It's like, you know, the schools always have the contest. We got the art contest and the poetry contest. So <laughs> I did the art contest and I won every single year. <laughs> so I said, I ain't got to write no poem. <laughs> I knew I was getting one of them. I'm like, yo, I, I'm never going to write a poem. Why? Because I'm going to win the art contest. <laughs> I'm serious. That fourth grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, tenth grade. And then we started like, competing against, because I went to an architecture school. Yeah, yeah. So we started, we competed in New York State against all the, you know, I mean, schools in New York State that have architecture programs. And I, I and as a tenth grader, I got honorable mention in rendering. What a renderer is, is that you see a, 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 you know, a blueprint and you render and you come up with a facsimile of what that you know, blueprint is gonna look like when it's finished. Today, they do everything with computers. You know, pop, 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 pop. But yeah. back then, you had to use your hand and your imagination. And I got honorable mention. So everybody was thinking that, yo, man, next year at, at New York Tech, Chuck gonna take it, you know? And I didn't win place a draw. So I was like, I was pissed. Twelfth <laughs> grade again, I got up there and got another honorable mention. So I got a scholarship to New York Tech. But I didn't want to take architecture because I'm not good at math and I don't want nobody looking over my shoulder. So I went to Delphi to brush up on graphic skills to be an illustrator. In my first year at Delphi, I was a political cartoonist as a freshman. Now, coincidentally, I did, matter of fact, it was another black student. It was, was phenomenal because here we are, two black freshmen, and we had a full page in the school's newspaper that went all across the region, and we got two black cartoonists. Right. So I really was trained to be an illustrator, not a painter, not a sculptor, you know, a commercial art, meaning that you could get a job. So I always knew I was going to get a job. And, uh, but as a college freshman, I did a little bit too much hanging out at schools. Always going to the girls' dorms, <laughs> hanging out, playing ball, never going to class except for my art class, three hours long. You know, the best professors in the world. So the thing about it, like the thing about art, it's like everybody got art in them, but everybody can't get art out of themselves. And there's no bad move in art, but you've got to be able to get out of yourself or what it is. You have to, you know, it's it's about a style. And, it, and that's so important now because today, the world is about sight, images. People listen with their eyes. So a lot of times you see on social media, which has been a great tool for artists, that people are able to like do art and put it up right away. Like instantaneous, like, oh, here's a picture of so-and-so, Quest Love with Afro, and then boom, put it up. This has been a tremendous upside, not only the people that do music, that people can hear it right now without no intermediaries, but especially artists and other creators. So a lot of times you see young people try to draw, and this is a great way to start, I guess. You see something and you're trying to exactly how it looks, which is a good workout, but it's not art, especially in the, in the era of artificial intelligence. So as people get more lazy and more slow, uh, more into whatever, you know, try and then try to be perfect, you're not going to get perfect than AI. And the point I'm trying to make is that art is who you are. It's, the, it's your pulse. It, it, it is what's made when photography came in, they went into impressionism because it got away from trying to be exact. It got away from trying to be too shiny. And so the art is, it, for me, actually is like, it took me five years to get my style back. Because what it is, you have to have a style that depicts like, oh, I see who that, I see what that is. And that's why I always encourage people to say, 
you have art in you. Just be you. You cannot get more perfect than a machine. Right. And this has something to do with yeah. what people are in their existence, too. It's like they're working around trying to be perfect, trying to look perfect, trying to just get all that. And the whole thing, as we go further into the future, the art is the human flaw, the human error, the mistake, the, the soul, the grit. That's going to define human beings these next 10 years. Not the perfection, but the mistake. And living with it and say, it is what it is. It's the scar. <coughs> it's the stretch mark. It's, you know, it's the, it's the wobble in the walk. It's, that is the last bit. And art is, and I'm long-winded, but here, I want you to hear me. <laughs> art is short for artificial. It's a facsimile of life. It's not life itself. You still got to live your life, even if you carry the phone with you. It's, it's a reflection. You still got to be you. Art reflects it. You don't reflect art by following art. It comes out of you. Wow, wow. I mean, I could just sit there and look at the whole thing. You got to be in these times because everybody, well, that's just everybody. People look at artists just being, eh, just like they look at music, eh, and they look at creators like, eh. But we're next door to, to um, Crypto Arena, right? right? And LeBron James is breaking a record, and you can't say that, you can't say that you're better than that building. Because it's going to cost you money to get in, and the closer you get to that court, you have to spend money, and you ain't going to get on the court, and you realize that, I ain't no goddamn Le LeBron James, hell no. But in this, in the arts, people feel like, well, I could do what you do, and I'm like, nah, you can't. And when it comes to performing art, yo, yo, Ice like, <laughs> Ice and Sean are here, always see a new guy coming along, it's like, well, who taught you? Because you can do this thing, you know, among, you know, amongst your, <coughs> your brethren or whatever, but if I put you in front of 15,000 people, right. I'm going to be able to, I'm going to count nine mistakes. That's where you can't kind of make mistakes because you take up time. Right. You got to have your thing together. So it's like, okay, you're going to run out of breath. This dude's going to lose his voice after two days. <laughs> you know, you're already sizing it up. In sports, they see you coming. And that's why we're in the United States of sports because everybody is trained from ESPN to say, when I have a discussion about sports, I will not be stupid. <laughs> but when you ask them about music, the arts, hip hop, cats say any old fucking thing. <laughs> and they just think like, just cause they said it, it's gonna be said. And I'm like, no, there are facts that lead up to you being able to know that this is a performance art. Right, right. So this back to this, it's yeah. like, it's always been in me, um, but increasingly, uh, you know, so I'm this phenom up to 25 years old. I mean, I've been humble in hip hop and rap music, humble in music. Once again, I said I'm an artist doing music. In art, I was a cocky motherfucker. <laughs> I was the person that was looking at basketball and I said, I, I could get that kid, that kid's rap. I would be like, basketball, you know, we were on the same age. I'm like, that dude's only, he's only basketball because he's hanging out with Warhol. I am from Long Island, he's hanging out with them city cats. I could get that kid. He's trash, right? <laughs> That's how we are, man, for real. I would go around. My first job in New York City, listen, Manhattan, you seeing all this stuff on the last. I, my first job was in Manhattan in 1977, man. So I'm taking those trains. And I'll be like looking, I'll be on the E train, right? And there'll be a beautiful piece of graffiti covered up by somebody's whack ass shit. <laughs> and I'll be mad at the whack dude that covered the, the, the beautiful piece. Because I would say, well, just like people say with a mic, everybody don't deserve a mic. Everybody didn't deserve a can. <laughs> everybody didn't deserve a can. <laughs> Yo, this, this whack, yeah, listen. There's whack in every category of what people do. <laughs> Every, look, you might have a brush, you might have a pen, but you don't need to do nothing on a building. Leave it in a book so you get commission, man. Put the can down, man. Work it out. Do workouts before you do that. 
but in everything you do, like right. you know what I'm saying? Like back in the day when you when people had mic, there was one mic and you had to pass it. It wasn't like eight mics, man. It's like what the eight mics for? Yo, I finished rhyming, boom. And Furious Five, the best that ever did it. Would take one mic and it'd be you know be five of them. So they would know in line to say, well, well, these two gonna trade off. So they traded off to these two, and it ends with Mel. So they they, they made one mic work. How to make five MC sound like one? Whoa! And Grandmaster Flash, how to make a band come out of one dude? Yo, I mean that that shit was science. It was alchemy, you know, and it was damn near sorcery. So we, I understood. So by twenty five. It was 1985, and I'm like, hmm, you know, I love doing this thing. And I was doing hip hop radio at, at the beginning of WBAU and Spectrum City, and what we always wanted to do is treat this music right and be able to say, well, here's, we ain't trying to be a star over there. We thought the records and the recording artists were star. So do like, you know, like Don Cornelius. I didn't say I'm the, you know, I'm the, you know, I'm a Don, but not like Cornelius, but I'm the dark Dick Clark, ready to get it started. So, <laughs> and play the record. I don't, I ain't trying to be Run DMC over Run DMC song. So you play it. I know I'm gonna be fly with my vernacular, but do it, drop it, get up out of the way. That's what MCs did. Yeah. Because MCs, if you ask the great MCs, Melly Mel, if you ask Curtis Blow. If you ask um, Love Bug Starsky, yeah. if you ask the Eddie Cheapers and DJ Hollywoods, man, it's like, them dudes would get on the mic and they ready to drop the bucket for an hour. Mm -hmm. Now, this is before records. How are you going to rock an hour? Because me, even as being a hip hop fan, uh, um, fanatic and a participant in 79, I said, well, I was heard, hearing that the Eddie Cheaper was going to make a rap record. I'm dancing because, once again, you can't separate hip hop without the dance. Because if it ain't dancing, it's a security problem. All right? And it can't be penitentiary to e Leon Isaac Kennedy up in the gig either. You better have some women up in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the music better be unbelievable. And when Melly Mel got on the mic and like, one, two, one, two, it's like, okay, <laughs> you know? The cats wasn't playing around, man. And so just to say that when the cats was talking, when people were talking about it's going to be a hip hop record, I was like, this is inconceivable. I mean, hip hop is like a three hour event of, you know, you got cats like rhyming a little bit, hip hop, you don't stop, that's right. And you might hear DJ Hollywood like, oh yeah, baby, you know, DJ Hollywood, yes, right. Uh, somebody moved their car away from the back door. <laughs> and, and you hear good times underneath from good times. And yes, yes, y'all, you don't stop, you keep on. I got you, baby, I'll see you right after it's over. So they throwing everything, they throwing everything in the soup. So I'm like, how is this? I'm seeing this fly, but how is this shit gonna be on the record? And then Kim Tim the Third came out with with personality jock, the fat back there. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> close. And then when Rappers the Light came out, right. that was all she wrote. You know, this what? is 1979. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, fast forward. You know, I'm at school, and I'm like saying, well. I'm a phenom in school, but I got kicked out on my first year after a freshman. Once again, you a phenom in your department. When them grades came, right, <laughs> I got a paper, and then you want to hear this story. Trust me, you want to hear this story. You want to hear this story. May 1979, right? I get my paper, right? And I got elves. I got eyes. <laughs> eyes is for incomplete. My ass turning it over thinking that the shit's gonna change. <laughs> Still eyes. <laughs> Sir, you are no longer at Delphi University. They didn't give a damn whether I was a school cartoonist. Dude, you just didn't show up. Matter of fact, I'm trying to, you know, when you're 19 years old, 20, you're trying to fool. Who are you fooling? I would go to a class that I didn't uh, attend in like 
five weeks and come in there and pretend that I've been there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you know, in college, in college it's like, it ain't like high school, like, sir, where you been? She said, I'm up there teaching. I mean, the first thing that led me to do that, which really led me to get kicked out of, of the Delphi University, is that I'm sitting there as a freshman, and I'm sitting there, you know, you're coming as a freshman in high school, and I'm seeing, you know, this other person sit next to me, this, this, this woman, and she's teaching, right? It's like an English uh, a kid or something like class. I forgot the class. She's teaching, and the person gets up and walks out. And I was like, you could do that shit. <laughs> I said, I never saw that. <laughs> she just got up and walked out, and, and the professor just kept on teaching. I'm like, wow. And once I started to do that, I was like, it just went down here for that. Fast, so fast forward, I get kicked out. I go to the Dean of Arts and Sciences. That's the way the department is at. And the Dean at that particular time, right, already knew I came in as a phenom, right? So he was like, I just don't, it was damn near like the Cooley High speech, man. Like, <laughs> with Garrett Morris tells, you know. He's like, he's like, right now, I don't understand it. You show up to your classes, you're a phenom, you do it, everybody loves you. But you, I don't understand this. So it's like, let me tell you this much. Yeah, you out of here, but I'm going to make you a deal and I'll never do this because I skip you the school cards. I mean, you're, you're one of the greats, but you believe in it too much. I won't do this. Make you a deal. If you sit in every single one of those classes all over again, and you got to ask each one of your professors, can you do it? I will reconsider it when you sit in every single one of those incomplete, it was seven of them, incomplete classes. Now, some of them go on sabbatical. I don't know what the fuck is sabbatical. <laughs> sabbatical. Yeah, they might not even be there. If one professor says no, deal's off the tape. You have to go to Nassau Community College or some shit like that. You ain't coming back up in here. And I was like, so I had to ask each one of those professors, can I take your class all over again? Luckily, every one of them said, yeah. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is May 1979. So what I did, I, I made up, I sat in every single one of those classes. Yeah, a couple of months sabbatical, which meant I had to take that shit like a year and a half later. And finally, 1981, they looked at my thing, I sat with them, and I got reinstated. From that point on, I knew that school was a business. It wasn't about liking you and all that, it was a business. Now, you try not paying that bird saw, you out of there. <laughs> Went in there, I was dean's list by 1984. I, was, I got the good year award, I did everything. But the thing that got me, and the, the, the closer point to that, the thing that got me galvanized through the rest of my whole collegiate career, I said, shit, hip hop records? I'm gonna at least work for a record company doing that, I'm gonna start hip hop art departments. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me through the whole thing. I said, I'm gonna be the greatest graphic designer ever in hip hop, because I thought hip hop graphics up to that point was whack. I said, <laughs> if I come in this game, I'm gonna revolutionize the whole entire hip hop game from a graphic standpoint, yeah, Graffiti that's dope can live. That don't need to be graffiti, this need to be Helvetica. You know what I'm saying? This need to be, you know what I'm saying? So I, I came out of the full game. Got out in 1984. So 85, I was like, yo, we wanted to syndicate the radio, we wanted to get, I, I was gonna go into like, well, you know, let's set up an art department that do, you know, you got rap albums coming out. And I would be picking out like, ah, they made a mistake. I saw a, a 12 inch as we were going through crate records, right? And I, I handled, you know, thousands and thousands of records. And I saw this record with a great design on it. And it had a turntable on, and it said Def Jam. And the thing is, I saw it, it said, you know, it was Def Jam, but the thing about it, it had a big D and a big J. And I said, who the f designed that shit? And I was like, that shit is right. And that was T. LaRock on the street rock wave, 
and it was It's Yours, and that was the beginning of Def Jam, and then they went into Purple Label. I said, wow, they got it figured out. And co coincidentally, it was like Rick Rubin was, you know, <laughs> from Long Island, <laughs> right? I was like, wow, man. So I knew that there was a future for my art in the record business, no matter what. But one thing led to another thing, being involved in the hip hop circles and all that. Okay, I was kind of rapping on the sideline, but not as a rapper to make a record. Right, right. I'm making, I'm rap, I'm rapping to fill in the time on radio. Because we didn't have enough rap records, so we had to fill up nine hours of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm rapping to do promos, and Cats is like, this dude's what the, <laughs> they wanted the promos, they said, we got to have this guy. And who's the guy? Well, we signed LL Cool J, and he's getting ready to come out next year, and we had the Beastie Boys with Rick Rubin. But get one of those guys from WBAU, because we gave Run DMC their first interview, Beastie Boys, all that stuff. We got to have Chuck on Def Jam. So for two years, Rick Rubin's trying to chase me down to record records on Def Jam. I'm like, ah, I'm not trying to rap on a record, because one record, and I'm the guy that categorized uh, two rooms of records. What big deal is one record when I got to do two rooms of records for work? And I'm stacking and piling records. I'm like, I ain't going to do nothing for my ego. Can we actually get a piece of this record company's art department? But one thing led to another. And so 1985, I started shifting gears. Um, okay, I mean, all right. And so 1986, I surrendered. And I signed my contract, and now I gotta be a damn recording artist. <laughs> and you'll get your picture me in my central page years. And um, tell me what, so, so long story, right? I don't do much art for 30 years. My dad transitioned, matter of fact, seven years to the day tomorrow. He transitioned seven years ago. Um, the arts kind of led me into covering up the silence because you talk to you know a person 55 years and then all of a sudden you're not hearing that 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 voice you know what I mean that's something we all got to go through right but it's 55 years before I actually dealt with a, something like that so I've been blessed to not have any loss in my family up to that point and somebody said it's like you know it, you could look at it as a tragedy but it ain't and that cleared me up but that was part of the story other part of the story is like i don't want to hear somebody tell me he's in a better place because ain't nobody got you know god's credit card numbers so, you know what i'm saying i wasn't <laughs> convinced with all oh, yeah yeah right so you know i had to know to my soul where he was at so my pilates coach <laughs> Actually, it wasn't Pilates. A Pilates coach was part of the ayahuasca community. Yeah. So, yeah. I had ayahuasca explained to me by the great Timmy Comerford, oh, wow. the bass player of Rage Against the Machine and a bandmate of mine in the Prophets of Rage. And Timmy is so descriptive. He was telling me when he was 21, when he collided with DMT. <laughs> So Timmy's a character, and I move my seat over this way as he's explaining. <laughs> and Timmy's like, you know, when cats do mushrooms, you see an elephant on a bicycle, go like this, and it disappears. Says DMT, you see an elephant with a bicycle, you go like this, and the elephant says, "Yep, I'm here." <laughs> So I'm like, all right, whatever, right? But then it happened to be like, I'm explaining whatever, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm healing or whatever, you know, it's the beginning of Prophets of Rage and all that. And my Pilates coach is just like, okay, you know, like I know this person or whatever. And uh, make a real long story short, um, you know, I had the shaman, sister who goes back and forth from Peru, she's ordained, come to my house. Now, all I want to know is, like, where's my dad? I want to feel my dad somewhere. And this is all leading to the story, so I hope they'll kick me out of this building. But I'm telling you, you're going to be thirsty for it. Here. And they're going to come on social media either. <laughs> <laughs> it'll end up there, but, but listen. So 
And my and my oldest daughters were all nervous and whatnot because I don't smoke weed, I don't do no drugs or nothing. And they're like, Daddy, smoke weed first. <laughs> <laughs> no lie. So I'm up here, you know, like I, I go through, the, you know, go through the things. I, I just gotta do this for myself. So um, she comes to my crib. I do the enzymes. She's got, you know doing this to my heart. And you know, I took it in small pieces of chocolate, stuff that you get arrested for in this country. <laughs> and you know, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, <laughs> I wanted to run out into the street. <laughs> but I said, nah, this shit is inside of me. And then the, then the room started doing, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, we go through a little search or whatever. And um, the three quarters through the journey, I felt my, I heard a, through the, right here, the top of my head. It's like, I love you, son. I love you, son. And it only happened for like a second or two, but then it was like, wow, I, you know, I got it. You know what I'm saying? And that was it. One thing also happened. I'm at my crib, man. A door swung open and stayed, it stayed there by itself. And my shaman, she said, nah, that ain't him. <laughs> <laughs> I said, when I come down off this journey, I will be checking that motherfucking door and getting the rest of the leave. <laughs> so I came down, I felt I got my answer. Now, you know people that do, you don't probably know people that do that shit as a recreation. Oh, I got to go to Ayahuasca this weekend or whatever. I, I got my answer. I had to do it again. A year later, this all leads all of this. A year later, one anniversary since. I'm like, nah, well, I, you know, our Pilates teacher says, well, I have a community come over to my house. Yeah. Yeah, well, come on through, at least it's a year later, or whatever, see how it is with a community. So I'm like, I, I got my answer, I don't have to do it again. It's like, it was great, it was dope, whatever. So I go to the, the house, and it was about 10 of us, right? And same shaman administered the, 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 the you know, Chocolate, the DMT and the chocolate. The ayahuasca is a ritual. And, you know, 10 people in different parts of the house. And I said, you know what? I told my uh, coach, I said, you know what? I'm going to sit right here, right in the living room, in the one spot. But Kathy, bring me, her name's Kathy, bring me a ream of paper and some markers. Because now I'm like, okay, you know, like, I, I ain't really looking for nothing, right? And a lot of times people do ayahuasca to go there and get these these designs. I said, I'm gonna go and on a journey and come back and come up with some great architecture. That's why y'all see crazy ass architecture. Like that. <laughs> How do they make a building that goes like this? You know, you probably visit, figure out the physics. So I didn't, I'm like, so anyway, I do it. And the crazy thing now. This I mean, I'm not selling y'all on none of this. So you shoot whatever you want. This I'm only doing shit for how it's going to engage with me. Because right. I already feel like, you know, I, I, I know where I am. I, the first time I did it, you know, the shaman said, you already are, are creatively pregnant anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do as artists. We do, and we're able to go into ourselves, and we're able to reach in ourselves and come out with something. That, that's the essence of art. You're, you're pregnant with ideas and creativity. You're boiling all, t all the time. There is no time off. You're in constant motion of creation. You're on fire all the fucking time as an artist. So she, she said, you already are, you're able to descend into yourself and elevate past yourself. You have that ability. I said, yeah, I've always been able to do that. You're just explaining with this, with this journey what I've been doing all my life. I don't even need it to go in myself. So I was at her house the second time around, and I said, give me a ream of paper and some markers. She gave me a ream of paper and some markers. I sat in one spot in her living room on a chair. And of course, everybody else going through, you know, their thing or whatever, and everybody was administered, and everybody got different things. You know, one person's coming by asking crazy ass questions. You know? <laughs> and I'm going like this, and I'm drawing out of my mind. And I come up with 80 illustrations and four hours. Now, the illustrations are not coming from anywhere else except for here. And as an artist, it's all about sometimes it's, you know, people draw by drawing the outside and filling the in. For some strange reason, everything that was coming out of my hand was the energy forming the contour on the outside. 
So it was the energy and it formed me when I was already of energy, uh, energetic style anyway, but this was accenting it. So it was forming the outside left. And the first time I've ever seen it, so as I'm forming the outside of these illustrations and moving paper like this, 70 illustrations out of my head, right? Going like this. The, the, the crazy thing is, I was clear as a bell, just like I am in this room. But everything was channeling through this without even looking at it, right? When I stopped, that's when the room started to twist. <laughs> okay, when I stopped, then I started again, then I was clear, and my, my hand was ruined. So when you come down, when I was finally coming down, lay down on the pallet, and I'm laying, but my hands are like this. 70 illustrations in four hours, formed with the inner energy. So when it, it taught me, it's just like, okay, damn, I could, I could, I've always been able to like, I don't need any, to see anything. I can go off a total recall. I'm always terrible with lyrics. It takes me 10 times to learn a lyric. Like I'm, I'm one of the original, I'll fuck a lyric up, you know? <laughs> I still don't know the Temptations song, man. I know you want to be me, but I'm like one of those cats. But I have total recall on every image that I see. Now, in fact, I'm doing a book right now. It's called The Moments That Met Me. So I can actually, you know, through my perspective, I can redraw that whole scene and I do it in illustration. So it's a little cartoony, but it's a little bit wired. It's a little bit perfect. If I want to make it on, I drop back on it. So that is what told me that my expression has always been able to pull out of me. And now I have it in a situation where it's so like since 2016, and I'll, I'll end on this note. In 2016, I've done over 28,000 illustrations. Wow. Now, now, the answer is, I think we got Tim Creek here, our, our, our dutiful road manager, tour manager, Superman. When you go on a tour, right, the thing that becomes really difficult is downtime. They're like, oh man, tour, man, go on tour, be on tour, come on out here. Okay, I know how to handle my downtime, but still downtime is downtime. Okay, we're getting ready to play, you know, the show in San Antonio, but we got three days in San Antonio. There's only so much going to the bar, going to the club, seeing the river walk that somebody want to do. Take your ass to your room and watch corny ass TV or, I mean, really, downtime. And this is where a lot of young cats get jacked up because they can't. They can't manage the downtime. They got a space of time. I heard, I learned from, I heard a rumor about Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones, who's one of my heroes. And he said, before Ronnie Wood goes in the hotel, I heard the rumor that he sketches every hotel room he's in. And when I heard that, and Ronnie, Ronnie Wood is nasty, nasty. And um, I heard that, I was like, wow. And so the Prophets of Rage, which was like four years, you know, every spot in the world, playing in front of seven million people. But, you know, it, it, the travel was great. We had a lot of downtime. I turned my hotel room into an art studio. So in the beginnings of that 2016, 2017, 2018, I just had stuff that was around. And there's like, oh my God, let's see if we can make a book out of it. And Genesis Publications in the UK was, is, is a, is a company that actually has artists do art and all aspects of art. Tom Morello also has a book, and because we was with the same management situation, the connection, uh, Ken Levitan from Vector was like, hey, you know, they want to see if they want to do a book. He connected with Lori, and then boom, he had to come up with the first <coughs> art book. I also have an art imprint label with Akashic book in, uh, Books in Brooklyn where I'll be releasing Napa Grovels. You know, and I and that goes the next. And that goes and I got I got a box that come out this year. So I have so much art pouring out of me, but I don't just want to do art for art's sake. It's almost like now I can't type or uh, my writing is atrophied out of I don't want to type a story, I don't want to say a sentence. I'm gonna give you a picture, it means a million words. So a lot of time when I'm on social media or this cultural media app called Bring the Noise, if I see something crazy, 
I'm going to illustrate it and then boom, put it on the wire and immediately like, oh yeah, I get it. As opposed to, I mean, if you're on Twitter, they give you 220 characters. I could convey sentiment out of my illustration and a title that's going to people like, yeah, I get it. Because what? We're in a visual age. People listen with their eyes. And then, because, and, and then people also can tell what's real and what's fake. And what I mean by fake is like, you can do art and put it through a filter, you take a picture, you put it through a filter, so it's the corniest shit ever, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And artificial intelligence, uh, but they can't get that bend in it. They ain't got no soul to it. So I might do something to make somebody's nose slightly larger, right? I might twist their whole eyes into something. And it's like, it's all illustration. I've learned from the best cartoonists, I learned from the best teachers, professors, and most of all, you learn to just be you. So it, in this book, Living Loud, it's a wonderful job put together by book creators that's already been in the flow of artists. And Ronnie Wood, it also has like a, a series of books with, with Genesis. So it actually has like, you know, I mean, I mean, if I want to get fly, you know, realism, there's the great Adam Yauch. I got Iceberg in there. I got all my heroes in there. But I got my, you know, my, my folks in there, Flav, you know, and, and, um, I think we're going into an area, you know, Prince. Mm -hmm. uh, but you gotta give us the story about Prince and, and this and, and, and the garage sale that was happening. You gotta, you gotta tell us a little bit about this. Listen, that. man, I'm 62. I ain't got nothing but goddamn stories. <laughs> <laughs> Been here all day. And I, and listen, yeah. and I'm the second best storyteller in the room. You ever heard Ice talk? Yeah. <laughs> the second best storyteller in the room, and then you'll be here for days. <laughs> but yeah, Prince. <laughs> I don't have pancake stories about Twix. <laughs> Let me tell you, listen. Eddie this Murphy is a picture right here. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Eddie Murphy and Charlie Murphy and Vernon, who's with uh, K-9, they grew up down the block from me and Roosevelt. We all from Roosevelt. So everybody like, oh, Dave Chappelle, the stories about Rick James. I heard them stories in 1981. <laughs> I heard them stories in real time. You know what I'm saying? When they happen, man, you, who you gonna tell? Oh, oh man, I heard Murph went out there, yeah, man, they did it. it's 1984, people ain't gonna believe you. So, um, seeing like uh, <laughs> Charlie Murphy talk about Prince and the pancakes thing, it's like, my story about Prince was just like, just regular, it's like, um, I go out to Paisley Park, we're, we're doing a song together, and, uh, hey Chuck, you wanna do a song? You know, that's, that people. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, Prince, and it happened to be in 1999, too. But the crazy thing about Prince, you know, gave the track, I recorded it, and he says, okay, just, just wait outside the lobby. <laughs> and, and, sitting in the lobby. <laughs> My feet are on top of the symbol, <laughs> which I'm mad to this day. And another side story, you know, the symbol, he gives me when the symbol has a keychain, right? I'm in the Atlanta airport. And they, they say, well, what is this? I said, well, we're going to keep it. And they go with a weapon at the time, right after 911. So I'm like, they're going to be able to stab everybody with it. You know what I'm saying? It's a print symbol. Like, Sorry, brother, you know, I never went back to get it. But anyway, my feet were on the symbol, and Prince was like, you know, I'll be out in a second, man, but you know, y'all hang here, whatever. And I'm looking through the glass, right? And I swear, like, I'd be like seeing his arms go up like this, and tape going like this. It was like he was making a salad. Like, <laughs> like, like the, the, you know, it's like, da, 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 da. And then I'm looking through the plexiglasses, into the city, I was like, what the fuck? After 45 minutes, come on in. And sure enough, man, that dude, <laughs> not only did he play everything on it, he engineered everything on it, engineered me through the glass, and then told me to step outside, you know, put it, and yo, man, it was glass, man. Wow. They, they, look, remember back in the day when they said, oh, Prince, you make too much music. I mean, this building even said it, you know, <laughs> you know, it's making too much music. Come up, come up right now, they haven't made enough. You they can't, can't get enough of Prince's music. Everybody's like looking for Prince music. Like, what else did he do? He did that, you know? And he knew what he was doing, man, way ahead of his time. But yeah, that was very enjoyable. And he's, um, and, and today we have, look, we don't have Michael Jackson. Yeah. We don't have Prince. Uh, other day I was 
you know, yesterday at the, what was it, two days ago? Grammy Award? Yeah, two days ago. Yeah, right? Um, I was walking with the great Nile Rogers. And now it's still here. Won a Grammy. Now it's still here and, and rocking music. And, and you cannot not mention the power of now Rogers' influence on hip hop because good times in 1979, and I'm a chic fan. I'm like, I, you know, I'm dancing. You know, I'm, you know, I'm dancing on the floor. That's how you got, and got engaged with me. You could be the wallflower. You know what I'm saying? You know, dance, dance, dance. Everybody dance. Freak out. All that, man. All of a sudden, 79, man, I'm on the dance floor. I said, we got a new song by, you know, Nile Rodgers and whatnot, you know, Chic, right? You thinking like Chic going to give you some bounce, right? And all of a sudden, they said, they stopped the music. It is the new one by Chic, man. Eddie Chiba broke it. Yeah, down, down. We was like, where is this country shit right here? <laughs> it was so slow. It was like, whatever. And then they played it again. And then they played it again that night. And within two weeks, the DJs got a hold of this record. Blank, think, 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 good time. And they turned it into something else. Yo, man, by the summer of 1979, cats was scratching with their hat. Good, 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 good time. It's by no mistake, by October, what's the first record, you rap record you hear? Rap is the light. Sugar Hill Gang. Dum 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 right? But what you hear is not a test. I'm just rapping to the beat, you know? And it's on good times. And whenever I see Nile Rodgers, he's the Big Bang Theory. Because without, I mean, good times play, it didn't invent hip hop, but it made the rap record just automatic. And he, I mean, that good times, man. Good Times was a record that was so it didn't stop for two years. It didn't stop for two years. And DJs? Man, DJs get that good, they rolled up, good time. It was on, yo. It was on. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much I could talk about art, because art speaks for itself when it's graphic, you know? Look, one thing, one other one I want to point to is in, in, in this book, because obviously all of these paintings have stories behind it. But can we go to the Public Enemy logo uh, uh, just, uh, that you have painted in here? Just talk a little bit about uh, how this logo, because obviously you did. You said you were an uh, artist who so happens to, yeah. to do to do rap. So what what inspired you in creating the Public Enemy logo? Hank Shockley and I we used to throw a lot of gigs, man. And we threw gigs on Long Island, man. Long Island is a Long Island, Queens. Bronx, um, Brooklyn, see, Brooklyn and the and Queens of Kings and Queens County. That was all considered Long Island. That's why Long Island University is in Brooklyn. You know, As a matter of fact, Brooklyn. When they built the Brooklyn Bridge, it was the first time that New York City said, "Listen, it won't be its own city. It's a part of New York City, and we'll make that one of our counties slash AKA the boroughs, which is Kings, Kings County, Queens County." <coughs> The Bronx, which is the, the Bronx is the only part of the continental United States of America. United States, I mean, New York City is all what, peninsulas? And, and you know, East River is not a river, it's a barren strait. It goes around the Long Island Sound into the ocean. And so it's like New York City is really like islands, man. That's why the great Woody Guthrie talked about from the, the to the New York Islands, and this land is your land. So. Um. Uh, yeah, so that's New York City. So when it comes down to um, uh, the logo, um, we did gigs all throughout Long Island, and we did illustrious flyers. Once again, I told you I wanted to do the best flyers, and you had unbelievable, incredible flyer makers. But you know, the cocky me was like, I could make a flyer to bust their ass. <laughs> I can I can I can make a flyer that make a thousand people come and get in the gig and say, damn, this shit was hyped, overhyped, there ain't nothing in there. <laughs> uh, I'll sell you wax sand on the beach. 
I mean, it was the same thing. I mean, people go and they pour syrup and only they, uh, the syrup. The label says unbelievable syrup. Well, I guess it's unbelievable. You know, they're greeting packages. So flyers, I, we, not only will we have the great flyers, but I'll fill it with illustrious names. And uh, you're wired into the hip hop. I mean, I'm wired into the great, you know, hip hop shows. So I always used to listen to dedications and shout outs. And it's always a dedication and a shout out by a crew that's calling into a radio station that wants their name shouted out and kicked. I mean, that's also how I got the Strong Island name. I was answering phones and one dude says, yo, man, what's up? I want this song, I want Buffalo Girls. But well, who is this? This Nick from Strong Island. I'm gonna write this shit down. <laughs> that's a lot, Nick. I would hear other radio shows. Man. One time I said, oh yeah, the shout out goes to Funky Frank in the street for us. I'm like, that's a dope name, even if they don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so one gig, I put Funky Frank in the street for us as an extra group, even though we didn't invite him. <laughs> and I did a logo for them too. <laughs> because, you know, the, the real talk. I was envious in Long Island, just like here with the punk scene in Los Angeles and Long Island with the rock scene. A rock group didn't have to be famous. They didn't have to go national. They could just get money. And many groups, rock groups, could just do Long Island, Jersey, Manhattan, upstate New York. They could just do those, just that, and never go nowhere. I mean, Kiss broke out of that. Kiss was a New York band that broke out of that. And later on, Anthrax was a New York band that went national and got a record company. But they didn't, they didn't make records. They just was a band, a rock band, and they played like 4,000 people a night in Long Island and Jersey. They wasn't going nowhere. They just like, we good, we making a living. And they all had logos. They had, it was un unbelievable. And so I wanted to do the same thing for DJs and rappers and mobile units, right? So when, I made, I, when we made flyers, we gave rap acts logos just like the rock guys on our concert, so people, we, we gonna beat every comp, every flyer out, right? So, Funky Frank in the Street Force is a group. <laughs> I don't know who it is, they out of Brooklyn, they called it in, whatever, they on, you on the gig, get the logo for them. I said, what kind of logo? I got, got Funky Frank in the Street Force, I guess they got <laughs> So I went through Right On Magazine, right? Right On Magazine was a magazine that covered black music and usually everything else but rap at that time, unless you was LL Cool J, the matinee idol type of person. And um, I'm like, fine. I mean, they put Michael Jackson in there a hundred times, right? And, and, and Lilo and people like that, right? So, <laughs> so I saw a picture with LL and had E Love. Standing next to him, like he, this is all he loved, you know, his his main number one dude, and all he loved did was this. <laughs> he had the fedora, the Run DMC fedora, because that was that the style on Jamaica Avenue in Queens, where they were from, Hollis, and everybody went to Jamaica Avenue on Long Island, and brought people from Nassau and Suffolk, and also Queens and Brooklyn to go to Jamaica Avenue to get their clothes. So that was the style hat that y'all saw Run DMC wore, wear, you know, and. E Love was just like that, so I said, mm, I'll make this logo. So what I did is, I, exact, I was an exacto knife king. I exacto, I was the no, the exacto knife whiteout king. And whiteout was invented by Michael Nesbitt's mother. Yeah, and everybody knows Michael Nesbitt. Who's Michael Nesbitt? Right. Oh, yes. See? Ain't no any shit, right? <laughs> so Michael Nesbitt's mother created whiteout, and I had the exacto knife. And I was a miracle on that. Boom. I cut out E Love's silhouette, threw a crosshair over it. And the thing that gave me the idea about that is that at that time on ABC, they had a, sh a show like on, on a G the G Men. And I think it was Alvin Corpus, G Men, FBI, Public Enemy Number One. But it was a kind of like in stencil letters. That was Public Enemy. As far as this funky Frank in the street force, I said, boom, that's a B-boy, I'm gonna put a target because we as black males are being scrutinized and watched and terrorized. Wow. Especially in New York, especially in Long Island. And Long Island was basically the, the mob moved out to Long Island 
And they actually damn near like, you know, they they talk, they they the police. That's why when people talk about gangsters, I'm like, yo, man, the number one gangster is the government, yo, for real. And Nassau County Police, they automatically say you can protest all you want. Our motto is shoot first, talk about that shit later. That was always Nassau County. They said, listen, you come out here, we not only the mob, but we the police and the mob. Now, y'all got to come up with something to beat that shit. Go get your cousins from Queens and Brooklyn and see, what, see, see what's what. Because you got to get out here and you got to cross some roads. And you got and that we even turned that around how it worked for us. Because we knew if you came to Long Island and you started a problem, you can't get out of here. That cut off the, the, the 98 posse actually was the thugs, but they worked on cars. And they all had Oldsmobile 98s. And so when cats came from Brooklyn, or anywhere else that started a problem, them cats would be like, they can't get out of here. All we gotta do is cut off three roads. And that was a, just so, they was actually the adversaries to the S1Ws when we threw parties in the beginning. And then they teamed up, because everybody wanted to come to a Spectrum party. So not only do you have the thugs, you got the S1Ws, and you got cats already in jail who related to everybody. So you didn't want to come to Long Island and mess up one of our parties. We, we, we got it covered like wallpaper, like do on the grass, right? So I, anyway, long story, boom. Funky Frank in the street for us. That's the logo, right? When we started Public Enemy, I was looking at that Funky Frank in the street for us logo like, yo. <laughs> And I never, I never, I never met Funky Frank in the street. I never met Nick from Strong Island. I never, I got them both serious, life is life. I got them both through the phones on phone call shout outs. And that's where that came from. I was like, wow. I, and, and I'm telling you, Public Enemy already had it figured out. Stencil letters, Public Enemy, crossbar in the middle, because that's what Run DMC had, the crossbar in the middle. But the key in the logo, and this is the key in the logo, because a lot of times people will talk about, you know, it's a great thing that you have outside people or art departments come up Wu Tang. Yeah. But it's a W and it's also an act sickle, but it's a W. Very clever. Um, and they have other, like the high row with the circle and the three dots. But the thing that I come from the schooling is saying, can I actually put something there that has no font, no letters, but you know exactly what it says? You know what I'm saying? And um, when you see like a pointed hood with two holes in it, what does that tell you? <laughs> you don't need nobody to tell you. What does that mean? <laughs> you know exactly what that means. You know what I'm saying? So symbols matter. And I, you know, and I had enough training. I'm, I'm all, but also, I'm a sports fan. So a lot of times, the sports fan, you know, sports, they, they can't mess around. They're in competition. So as a matter of fact, even when they deal in situations, you know, images could get them in trouble. Like, the Cleveland Indians changed their whole everything because it became derogatory. But they had Chief Wahoo. And cats what I mean, you go to fight, fight, get fight will be wearing that eighty because it was fly, but at the same time it's like, nah, because the indigenous people of this land said, no, we're gonna stop that. Uh the the Illinois, Illinois um team over at the University of Illinois, the Illini, they gonna change their thing. The Washington Redskins, y'all better be the commanders. <laughs> they just you know, the indigenous people said, you know what, symbols matter. You know, we, matter of fact, we don't even want to be called Indians no more just because Columbus fucked up. Oh, yeah. Excuse my language, but that's what Columbus did. You know, because he was twisted and everybody like, oh, the Indians. No, he got lost. <laughs> anyway, so that's the, the meaning of that. <laughs> but, but it's a service. My mind, I feel for hip hop. I, I, I tend to be in the back. I don't want to really be seen. I hate photography, being photographed. I hate being on videos. I hate being, I like being heard and way in the back. I'm a service person. This is, this is my military. This is my worldwide religion. 
it has taken me across the world to meet so many great people to try to be an asset and, and, and enhance people's lives to make this thing, you know, better than how I found it. And I receive and I don't accept any accolades to me personally, you know, my crew, my people, my, my great friends. I mean, it gets no better than, than this because we can do something with the, the connectivity of human beings, man. And we can make that, and that's where a true movement are. We have to have a movement for, for our lives, man, to, to be here on this planet, to make it seriously something to pass on to human beings to treat it better than how they found it. Um, the greed of, 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 of the past has really put the place in a bad space if you have to come up with a year 2040 and 2035. Because the biggest difference, and people to ask me all the time, well, Chuck, what's the biggest difference between 1989 and 2024? Biggest difference is that people have come and gone. Human beings have come and gone. People that was in the mix, making it move and shake back in 89, a lot of them are no longer here. The next 20, 25 years, a lot of them won't be here. Within the, the last 40 years, the last 50 years of hip hop, people have been born within it and have died within it. All right? Those are real talks. The numbers matter, man. You might see people talk about, oh, AIDS ain't nothing but a number. Yeah, gravity don't work that way. Because <laughs> mathematics says this thing's gonna go around the sun again, and you better figure out how to ride and dance with it. <laughs> you gotta figure out how to dance and ride with gravity. Because gravity is going to take your ass down anyway, so you got to figure out how to make your make it with the maker, you know what I'm saying? And deal with it, and dance with it, embrace it. And that's the beauty about the arts, man. And another thing about the arts that's so great is that in hip hop, right, my peers, and that's what the other night, right? And my last note is that it ain't no automatic while wow, we was fly as fuck the other night. <laughs> it ain't no one man thing, man. It ain't like push button. There had been so much into the soul and crystal of us. And you know, not to say it was the first time it ever happened. Whenever anybody saw Muddy Waters and the Howling Wolf, Big Mama Thornton, man, when they bellowed, I mean, one time I was in front of like Coco Taylor, and she was like 78 years old. So she got on that mic, and I was like, damn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it ain't, you know, it ain't no mistake when this thing opened up. Furious Five, Grandmaster Flash, Rock Kim, you know, me and Flav, you know, Iceberg, Too Short. Yo, man, Cats was like, we do this. This ain't artificial intelligence can't better this thing. You don't even know where this thing came from. No mistake on why it was so fly. It's just like you can't even put it in a bottle. You can say you have a company that owns it, cool, whatever, you're cool, whatever. You can't really, when when it goes, like when Ray Charles passed, yeah. that shit ain't ever coming back. Right. Ray Charles passed, that is gone. It's a moved on. You got a recording, and that's what you have. You don't have Ray Charles. You know, you got, you know, so last note, we learned how to be spectacular. Spectacle get you in the building. That's what the AEG and all these companies like, they want to create spectacles to pack a place. That's fantastic, man. I mean, you know, little boy Fox in the tub, man, that's spectacular. You got 80 <laughs> billion followers, man, great, you know what I'm saying? Spectacle, I'm interested for five seconds. Spectacular not only keeps you in the building, got you want to come back, I want to come back and see that shit again. I want to see them do the same damn thing again. And that's what's happening on a Monday and Tuesday, like, yeah, could I see that shit again? Yeah. <laughs> the cats keep running it back. And they're like, wow, I, I can't believe that I just saw this shit. Yeah. You know? I mean, I was with my man Schooly D, took him on a tour, and we played in Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And Schooly, who's another artist, matter of fact, hopefully this could start a long string. Schooly, me and Schooly D and Charlie Tuna think about doing art, hip hop, museum shows. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other people also. I mean, Charlie too is so nasty. And Schooly is just <laughs> good. So we in Lincoln, Nebraska on this tour. And this cat comes up to Schooly, man, and said, 
I didn't even know you was real, dog. I didn't know that you were real. I never thought I would ever see you in my life. So the artist embedded so much in the people when you connect it, you know, with, with people doing this thing, spectacular keeps you coming back for more. And that's what we try to tell the young acts. It's like, listen, man, be spectacular, man. Be spectacular, you know. Be something when you disappear, your mark is like etched. There's a mark, DMX, man, you still hear DMX without hearing them. You're like, damn, like, if all the person got heard, you're like, that's DMX. <laughs> <laughs> did, he, did he not make his mark? In this area, did he, man? Now, even young guys, I mean, you know, did Nipsey not make his mark? Yeah. So make your mark, man. Take it seriously. We appreciate the mark that you made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.